went over the steps of uh, the uh, secure boot implementation in Ubuntu, as exists in Ubuntu today, uh, and uh, as exists in Debian, which is kind of partial support, but not enough to actually do anything useful yet. I'm just, uh, I'm going to create a document that's going to be under DevConf 14 Bob. Too late. <laughs> What's it called? UEFI space Bob. Okay. So there you go. So we didn't have, uh, it's unfortunate we don't have a FTP master representation here because that was probably last time on as well. But uh, we largely <coughs> agreed that we are basically just going to clone the same general idea, uh, namely uh, we use uh, latest shim uh, with, which is a, a system which Matthew can probably explain more about, but whose purpose is to be signed by um, an entity like Microsoft, essentially, uh, and bootstraps our way into a better bootloader uh, like Grub, uh, which we can then uh, bootstrap the rest of the system from. Uh, the uh, Grub itself needs to be signed by a Debian key. Uh, so uh, we need to do that, I think, on FTP master uh, in order to have remotely acceptable security. Uh, to do that, we need to sort out key management uh, so that the, uh, uh, because this is obviously a, uh, an important point of attack, uh, so we want to have it protected in more or less the same kinds of ways that we protect the key for the Debian archive. So, so is it clear that an FTP team member walked into the room? Oh, uh, oh hello. <laughs> <laughs> it was not clear. <laughs> That's very useful. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm an FTP system, so I'm not a master, but absolutely. This can't be your fault. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can at least tell us whether we're um, confused about something about the chairman. Okay, so I'm just going to go over, uh, since there's a bunch of people here, I'll quickly go over <coughs> what Shim is, does, what features it enables that are relevant to Debian, and a few things that need to be considered based on some changing requirements. So Shim is an EFI executable which is in a format that is accepted for signing by Microsoft. It performs one real function, which is to execute EFI executables that are signed with a key that is not in the firmware key database. So EFI, UEFI secure boot systems have a database of acceptable keys, and executable needs to be signed by keys in that database to be executed through the standard UEFI mechanisms. Shim exists to be signed by a third party who is already trusted by the platform and then bridge that root of trust to a different root of trust. So the typical way of using it is for the vendor to ship shim signed by Microsoft or some other trusted third party and then embed their key inside that. Any further binaries that's assigned with that key, shim will perform its own validation, its own relocation and will launch them independently of the firmware so you don't need to go through the firmware <coughs> key database. In addition, Shim also supports its own user modifiable key database. So the end user can generate a signing key, install that in a standardized way that is consistent between different systems. It requires the user to be physically present. There's a point where it requires you to type in a confirmation phrase on a screen at the console. So it's designed to prevent it from being easy to socially engineer someone into installing arbitrary keys. Grub will then call into Shim in order to verify the kernel, so you can then have a fully signed root of trust up to the point where you then use whatever additional root of trust you want. If you wanted to build something on top of this where you had a verified inner MFS and a verified root file system, you could do that. That's not required as far as we're concerned. Once user space starts, then the usual trust model is that user space is assumed to be trustworthy, whatever it is. There's no enforcement there. The other thing you can do with this uh, key database is disable signature validation, which means that Shim will launch anything you give it. Again, that requires physical presence. Uh, you run a command under Linux, 
you type in a password, you reboot, and then Shim requires you to type in the same password again. And then asks <coughs> you whether you want to disable signature enforcement. And from then on, it will boot any copy of Grub, Grub will boot any kernel. So the user has a standardized way to disable this enforcement. Without disabling security? Without disabling security entirely. So that means that you don't have to jump through whichever hoops your particular platform vendor has implemented just in order to do kernel development or Grub development. Which is, which is quite a serious problem because the, at, present, at present, while uh, there are certain requirements on uh, firmware, uh, particularly from things like the, uh, the Windows 8 certification guidelines <coughs> on uh, what you must make available, it says absolutely nothing about whether this be remote, even slightly convenient. Uh, so or whether you can figure out from the menu what it's called. Right. Unless you deeply understand Secure Boot, you're half the time unlikely to figure out which option relates to putting it in setup mode. So the aim of all of this was to produce the least worst thing that still respects a user freedom. Um, I think we came as close as it's reasonably possible to get. The local key management stuff was did, uh, implemented by SUSE originally. Um, most of the rest of it was implemented by Red Hat. The future stuff there's not a great deal of additional work being done on Shim in interesting technical ways at the moment. There's support for ARM has just been added. It also has support for 32-bit x86. If you have one of the tiny number of systems with secure boots and 32-bit UEFI firmware, it has support for being a fallback bootloader where if you put it in a well-defined location, if the system loses all its boot entries, then Shim will launch re-enroll your boot entries and then boot normally. Also important for the systems that uh, don't respect the, the specs requirements on uh, where the boot loader is to be installed, <coughs> uh, fixed versus removable locations. Yeah. So one thing is that Microsoft have recently modified their signing policy slightly. In order to sign up to Microsoft Sign Service, you now require an extended validation certificate. So in HTTP land, those are the ones where you get the big green thing in Firefox rather than just the little one that also gives you the name of the company you're talking to. That <coughs> costs more money because it means somebody actually has to go to real efforts to verify your existence and identity. Not it also means you have to have a real existence and identity to right. be verified. <laughs> so I think the cheapest that I've seen so far is on the order of $1,000 for a three-year certificate. This is within Debian's realm, but is a little bit hostile to the individual end user. That's the shit. It also, it also doesn't fit That's the EV. I mean, the most expensive keys. Right. right, you can't sign other keys right. with you that. You cannot get a CAEV cert. But that's in itself not a problem. It's Microsoft originally requires that any embedded keys also be EV certs. It lacks that requirement. Yes. It's now perfectly accessible for you to generate your own key, but said key is supposed to be maintained in a FIPS compliant hardware device. Now, that sounds kind of terrifying, but FIPS compliant hardware devices include just Java smart cards. So that's not a particularly high hurdle to get over. Well, uh, if, you're a, if you're crypto, organization, then FIPS compliant usually means weaker than your best. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so a, a real hardware security module is way beyond the FIPS requirements here. A USB, sm a, a smart card that plugs into a USB reader is completely acceptable. There also exist USB tokens that effectively present as smart cards. Well, the thing that we're doing in uh, Infinite <coughs> is uh, none of the above, but we do use uh, uh, GS lists, so we have um, uh, we have three of seven requirements on uh, reconstructing our master secure boot key, which I don't know if it meets the letter of FIPS, but it is equivalent to spare. So the other thing is the Microsoft have no practice. way to verify this. Uh, it's because it's a key. Thing <laughs> yes. So. If that's already realize really too much that you're not doing what you claim you to You probably should not put that in the either pad. <laughs> <laughs> you probably also should not put that. Anyway. <laughs> it's a good thing that you can hear this on the screen. <laughs> so, um, but that's more a case of if you do somehow screw up, then there might be problems later. But just don't screw up. <coughs> so we have gotten informal at least uh, approval from Microsoft for our the, the key sharding that Colin yeah. described. Um, we 
haven't uh, actually gone through the, the certification process since they, or the signing process since they did change their requirements due to some other issues regarding um, minimum version requirements for SHIM that we need yeah. to uplift to. So the other thing in terms of SHIM development uh, is a desire to move to Shim's now moved to a model where the vendor certificate is stored in an additional section. It's not embedded in the code or data se segments. There's a separate section within the executable that contains the certificate. This means that if we do the appropriate work to ensure reproducible builds, even if you receive a binary from Debian, you will be able to verify that the binary you build from the source code is identical to the one in Debian with the exception of the certificates. You can verify that all the accessible code is identical. This is for two purposes. First of all, it means that users can actually trust the Debian or Ubuntu or whoever are building the binaries from the same source code. And that if it is backdoored, it's backdoored in the tool chain. Yeah, it's <laughs> not backdoored by Microsoft. Great. And <laughs> secondly, well, uh, you can check that in other ways uh, by we should like confirming that the signed object Yes. Yes. And secondly, this is also, we hope, going to make life easier for Microsoft because they'll be able to verify that the code's identical and if a binary matches something they've already signed with the acceptance of the certificate, then it can go through a shortcut right. this, signing this is, process. This is not through some altruistic desire to make life easier for Microsoft in general, it's because the signing process can take months. So, or result in rejections if they simply don't. In terms of the long-term politics of Microsoft being the signing thing, then that's going to continue being a conversation for a long time. I can't really say anything more about that at the moment. It's, that's not going to change in the immediate future. Nobody else has offers to take that role. Have we seen anything that suggests that they are not acting as a fair and honest custodian? We have not seen anything to suggest that they are acting in their own interests as opposed to others. There are ways in which they have been annoying in one way or another, but none of it is. None of it That's appears, none of it appears, none none of it appears to be malicious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're a signing authority, yeah. Yeah. and they're a large company. <laughs> so <laughs> they're <laughs> expect <laughs> something to yes. with us. So the, uh, there was a mention that we're going to need to start signing Grub. How would this interact with if we wanted to start having UEFI stub Linux kernels that can be directly booted rather than using Grub. Right. So the the way I designed this in Ubuntu permits both uh, the okay. So the state of the code in Debian today is as follows. Grub has a number of patches, mainly from Matthew slash Red Hat. Uh, which cause it to behave in a in a sort of secure but appropriate way when when loaded and such. So, for instance, uh, the the grub when the grub core image is signed, uh, it will refuse to load any modules which are not in the core image because that would amount to executing unsigned code in firmware context, which you're not allowed to do. As a result, we build a rather larger firmware, a rather larger core image in the. Uh, in the case of Square Root, that has everything we need. Uh, all that code is uh, is in Debian. Uh, the some of it, I think, is disabled, is configured off by default. But that's fairly trivial. Uh, the we have code to build a custom upload. Uh, so the sort of thing that a handful of packages do to put things into rather <coughs> odd places in the archive, for instance, DI uh, builds. Uh, Raw installer um, custom thing, uh, which is which ends up being unpacked by a DAC into or actually uh, by hand script I think into uh, installer dash thing somewhere under disks. That uh, we we have the we have the code to do something similar for UEFI. Uh, at that point, uh, DAC would unpack. The, uh, the raw firm, the raw bootloader images into disks, Jesse, men, UEFI, something or other, uh, and also sign those with the SP sign tool and the FEP. Uh, the, uh, I laid that out in the implementation I have today in Ubuntu, with, in such a way that you can have different uh, 
package, it's not just for grubs, so different packages could, uh, could do the same thing. Uh, the kernel could emit, in fact, probably should emit uh, um, uh, an object for signing in much the same way. Uh, for that kind of thing to be sensible, it has to be entirely automated, really. It uh, should not be uh, something that requires manual action by the team master, otherwise it's going to take a little week. But to answer another question that was possibly also what you're asking, Shim does not care whether you're looking grub, the kernel, or any other bounty if I'm executable. As long as it's signed with a trusted key, it'll launch it. You can tell Shim to just launch the kernel directly instead of having Shim launch grub. Oh, sure. I was more concerned with as we work toward trying to integrate UEFI direct boot into Debian, which I hope we do at some point. I would really recommend not doing that. No, it requires no. you to put the inner MFS on the UEFI system partition. That's just a bad idea. Don't do it. It's probably the common. I can imagine talk it. about that later. <coughs> well, I, I can imagine it being useful in specific situations. I don't think it's a general purpose. Anyway, just to clarify the. Uh, um, for this purpose of getting this working in Debian, you outlined at least uh, a to-do being enabling that code for secure boot and grub, but was, were there other things that I, I should note down as things we need to actually concretely do? To right, so I asked a question on IRC to Colin, who I don't think looked to scroll back. Um, <laughs> I recall that we had a to-do list that somebody said was recorded somewhere. Can we refer back to that yeah. earlier mm -hmm. document? What's the URL for that so we can grab that into the copy uh, here? Well, I sent in the mail, which is a summary of of uh, of, of last season's funding. It, it was hooked again very recently with a link on links on WCP and a few other places. So, the, I guess it would be a shame if we spent most of the time on the session moving that, forward, yeah. and rehashing that and and yeah. describing what Spear Boot is. And Uh, can we move on while various people try to find that? Okay, basically, uh, basically. The, um, can you paste it into copy? And, uh, you want the content or the link? The link is fine, thanks. One thing I one thing I want to add uh, regarding the state of the current code: at present, Grub is configured to uh, to permit you to put on sign kernels. Uh, this has been, to say the least, controversial. But the reason for that is that the version of uh, shim that has been in certainly Ubuntu and I think also to whatever extent it's in Debian uh, is uh, it does not have mock manager uh, enabled to uh, the machine over key thing that Matthew was talking about a moment ago. Uh, without that, if you require signed kernels, then the barrier to entry for um, testing new kernels, doing any kind of kernel development, etc., goes up. Very substantially. So we need mock to be in place before we can uh, require some <coughs> kernels. Uh, once we do, I'll be happy to revert that bit of grub, uh, and then we will not be in a position where there are many trivial kernel exploits that uh, that will get our key removed. So you're, you're saying like the step zero is get mock manager. Well, we can do we can do many other things in preparation, but step zero in order to get uh, uh, in order to get to sign kernels mm -hmm. is having more manager, so we don't need hinge unnecessarily on user freedom. We have a bunch of packaging that enables mock manager, and it's uh, just needs to get the new upstream version of shim for signing purposes. But any shim work in Debian is blocked on us having a Debian key in it. So I think that's what we need to really be talking about making sure it gets addressed. To see. So uh, the I do have looking at looking through Ben's mail. Uh, I do have some duck changes to uh, uh, to support this. Uh, I could really use assistance with setting up a test environment, or uh, you know, if, 
do in the A50, maybe it's just easier to test in the production system today, then fine, that's not a problem. Um, I, I can help you with that. I did a great round of here once and I Okay, thank you. Um, the, I, I would like to grab you then this week, so yeah. we can run through that. The, thing, the other thing that uh, is important there is that, as I said earlier, I think that this should run unattended. I would prefer not no. to effectively end up there. I prefer that this run unattended where possible. Uh, I don't want to be in a situation where all uh, grub uploads go through new, effectively. Uh, but uh, there's... If it is possible that we may want to make this require some kind of basic whitelisting or depend on the uploader's key or something so that we're not effectively saying that any Debian developer gets to upload an object which can, uh, which can get signed by Debian's secure boot key because that would be quite a, quite a large exposure. Uh, the compromise we have in Ubuntu today is that any uh, any binary upload that in it, that is going to go through signing requires uh, it does require button push sign off, uh, and we just check that it matches that is something that we've signed before, basically in the same kind of way. I mean, we know what it is. We can very very easily make um, new queue processing of your on every upload of the shim if you want to think. Yeah. Um, although we can make a little bit of policy in that. So, are you saying that's something you can work with Colin to make happen? I'm going to talk about the region about it, I guess. Okay. Um, the other important piece is actually having a Debian key, uh, which we do not have today. Uh, Tolef, I think you said you said a little earlier that you wanted uh, to have an HSM for this. If it's yeah, we want to have that anyway. Uh, just for the purpose. Is that something that you have hardware for at the moment? I mean, what, and if not, what's the lead time? I think we have the hardware. I would need to check. Uh, there's also it would probably also then be on a different host than the monster itself, so we would need to make that protocol prime, basically. Oh, one thing about the HSMs, uh, when we looked into the SIM we found that there were basically none on the market that had completely free drivers, which is why we ended up using smart cards. Um, is that your experience, or is that just not that much of a concern? I have one here. It has three, so three drivers. That's great. In that end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you fully you yeah. Yes, as, as, as you Okay. Can. So, I'm not sure it actually supports every thing we want to, so I, I would need to make sure it does that. Yeah. We and basically just need an RSA 248 key for this purpose. Yeah. Uh, but specifically, Is there like any reason we can just use any like we can just use a smart card, I guess? We can. Uh, actual smart cards are kind of finicky and yeah. break and stuff. Uh, and I, I use the uh, UBK, 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 uh, are you effectively volunteering to research and make sure that the HSM is acquired? Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure that happens. And then you said there was a second piece which was setting this up so it can be detached from FTP master. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't, we probably don't want that running on FTP master directly. Uh, possibly to limit the attack surface mm -hmm. so uh, the machine it would be running on would probably not be an i 6 machine at all. Would that be something you'd also be doing? Yeah, I'll need to check the exact status there, but yeah, I, I can make the DSA side of that happen. Okay.
recommended as a secure group with the mainline probe? Uh, it's the essentially the patch set, which is in uh, which is in uh, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, endemic in fact. Uh, so this consists of the Linux EFI module, uh, which is uh, uh, basically straight from straight from Red Hat with a couple of tweaks. Um, and I also added a patch to cause the Linux and initRD commands to automatically chain through to that, so you don't have to fit the right config file. Um, is this different than the ones that uh, SUSE is using? Uh, a I don't know what's in SUSE. It's essentially the same as what's in Fedora with possible. So do you have the um, automatic chain in no. of Linux to Linux to <coughs> Linux to Linux? No. You probably should. Yeah. That's so should they not probably just go upstream? Go. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> so it's been a little bit controversial there to um, the upstream center is not very keen on those. Uh, the I think the the most practical answer for the time being is a standard and probably really I can mm -hmm. speak to some people. I think the concern grow upstream have is probably <coughs> linked to assumptions about the FSF's desires mm -hmm. on this front. And I think if this can be made clear as the only way this actually does anything is to uh, guarantee that there's user control for keys. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a problem long term, but there's going to be some discussion about that and to figure out whether there is a way to determine an FSF wide policy well a wide policy perhaps. Kind okay. of thing. Uh, so, yeah. folks from FSF here, is that something that you can pull in for that discussion? Uh, John Sullivan's around. He's right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was just talking. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we can do that after this so we don't de uh, do well. No, I'm not saying derail, but like if there's a, a plan to have a conversation, can we? Let's, let's make that a to do. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, just to, we, we have this list of to-dos we're generating here. It seems like we got a couple of concrete things for, for dealing with the, getting the Debian key, hard, uh, the HSM pieces. Um, and then there, someone's gonna have to get the key. Then there, we're, you mentioned that we need to get mock manager support in the shim. Um, and there's Ubuntu stuff that does that. Is there someone who is going to take care of that? Well, I'm happy to maintain the shim package. Um, step minus one, mm -hmm. give me a key to put in. Okay. No, can get the new you can get the new device key. But I can, but it's not useful. And that's why I have an upload. Yeah. 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 If you want me to upload it with the Ubuntu key in it, sure. <laughs> so this this discussion you guys were just having was you need to set up a meeting with the SSF to talk about the uh, just to get it in the Freedom piece of that? Is that what? what Emerging the growth changes into into the right growth. What if any side so FSF? What if what if any objections to the FSF? Are we actually blocking on getting this machine drop? No. No. So this would just be in Debian. It would be it would be more convenient not to have not to be in too much of the bad old days where everybody had a gigantic grub patch set in every distro that was kind of ad hoc copied around. Um, that's not really very satisfactory, uh, but uh, it doesn't block us immediately. Uh, one, one useful thing that Grub Upstream did do in response to the, uh, in, in response to things like this was implementing its own verification layer. So you can, uh, uh, you can do uh, gcrypt based signing of uh, Grub modules. Uh, and it might well be nice to integrate that so that we don't have to embed all of the uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, modules that we care about in the core image. But again, not a particular blocker. So, just in, in terms of in, uh, in interest of making a clear to-do list, what is the meeting with the FSF that you guys need to have? Yeah, that's it not sounded like you didn't blocker. need to do that it, if you're it, not working. It's out of bound. It's it's not. Block all this at all. Okay. To try to be, try to make sure that Debian and DFSF are vaguely aligned on what we're doing and not doing with uh, uh, hardware enablement level support for UFI securities. 
two slots. And where the ACB patches up through this practical. Yeah. Are there any considerations for downstream distros that do not recompile all of the of ship parts of the on CDs for recovery purposes? Well, you're going to either have to ship the same Carlos Debian or you're going to have to also rebuild Grub and ship. Okay. And then the uses the terminal single How does that work? I mean, I know you're not lawyers, but how does that work if like, you're using like someone else, like a signed shim that's signed by Microsoft. As long as you're the shim shim. itself is not GPL, so there's no problem there. Grub is, but because it's used in combination with shim, it's always possible for the user to replace it with one they built themselves. So again, there's no problem with that. Stay, that's it. There's no Critical. GPL issue. Well, but, uh, so, like if I wanted to use someone else's Microsoft signed shim in my distribution. Yeah. I can do that? Yeah, you'll also have to use their variable and their grub. Or if they're signing shim. You'll have to use their signed packages. Well, well no, I mean like Ubuntu's now and the one you released a while ago. Yeah. You, you can do whatever you want. If you modded not without, without end user involvement. Right, exactly. If you want if you want it to be turnkey, if you don't want the user to have to set up their own machine on your key. Uh, in order to boot your distribution, then you need a little bit more. I'm booting, uh, it's either yours or, or, or the Ubuntu one that, that I'm booting a 32-bit kernel that I can file myself. The Ubuntu thing only works because today we boot uh, unsigned kernels after, okay. um, after the exit service. service is called. Okay. Uh, there's a USB. Yes, that's Tollocks. You hate yourself. I towards that. <laughs> that. That's why I'm, it's a hardware. <laughs> Hard to break. I suppose back kernels will be signed as well. Just like regular kernels. Um, yeah. Are, are we talking about uh, signing, shipping a Microsoft sign shim with Ubuntu? Uh, sorry, that's what we did. We're already doing that? That's what we yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not exactly pretty. Um, you Obviously, you're dependent on an external and not always friendly entity. Uh, you're, it means that in order to upgrade a particular piece of software, we basically need a sign-off from Microsoft, which nobody is very comfortable with. On the other hand, uh, the alternative is a long and protracted process of trying to set up a CA and getting that into enough uh, actual hardware that real users will be using uh, so that they can boot our systems. Uh, we, have, we, we did explore the possibility of signing with two keys, signing with um, Microsoft's key and with, one, and with one that we operated ourselves. Uh, that falls and runs a file of various firmware not actually supporting that. But they're not, I mean, Debian wouldn't do it, right? Wouldn't do it. ship a Microsoft sign chain? Yes. Well, yes. Well, yes. 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 What other options? Well, I mean, encourage people to use self sign keys the, and automate the, that. But the import, how are you going to put the installer? You need to bootstrap it. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you buy a PCB yeah, yeah. or if off the shelf, it only will trust the Microsoft key. So you either have to talk people into figuring out the obscure UI that's different on each hardware. Or yeah. have well, I've been through a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so the, the, the point for me is not uh, does it suck that <laughs> uh, we have to rely on Microsoft for this. Yes, it does suck. But I think it's more important that we not make the process of installing a free operating system on modern firmware be a process that involves typing in a long string of hex digits into your firmware setup screen before you can even start. The effect of that is going to be turning off lots of people from free software. Sure. And I don't see that as something that actually meets our long-term goals. Um, I'm not comfortable with all of the ways we have to get there. But as long as we're still building the actual software ourselves and the only involvement from Microsoft is a signature that we can verify 
refers to the same code, then yeah, I think it's basically acceptable. I mean, it, this is actually really good for my certain use case, which is uh, we release a, a, a live Debian live boot distribution, which nice. would be great to have Microsoft be in there. So, from what I understand from our, our to do list here, the, the uploading of the shim mock manager. Uh, the updating of the grub package to be signed by the monolith, monolith IPA5 <coughs> and the kernel team change that will be the uploading of kernel images that are signed. Those are all pending on the DAC changes. Yeah. And all of those are relatively easy things to do. They're just simple package changes and uploads. So maybe we need to do and, and there isn't anything else really that needs to be done that has been identified as additional tasks that since the last time we talked about this. Do we Is already, that correct? Do you already have uh, a process to acquire the key? No. Doesn't we know who's going to do that? Well, presumably it's going to be DSA that's going to acquire the key. Well, something else we haven't, haven't discussed is what is about uh, the, the this locking down things and the kernel. Uh, so the that brief mean? summary is that in a secure boot world, for meaningful security, you need to distinguish between the root and the kernel in terms of privileges. It should know. In the past, it was straightforward for root to modify the kernel in various ways, and, not and, there, was, and there was no particularly strong reason to prevent that because, at worst, they could always edit the kernel on disk and reboot into a new modified kernel. Secure boot prevents that, and so as a result, there is an incentive to lock the kernel down such that it's not possible to modify the running kernel even with your root, which means checking for signatures on modules. It means not allowing root to modify the kernel through any debug interfaces or through dev mem, or for the or for roots to be able to control PCI devices directly through their uh, resource regions. So various things, also um, kexec, it, it's really easy to use kexec to modify the running kernel. You can jump back into the first kernel from the second kernel. It's not like you actually have to kill user space to do this. It's, it's, there are, there's a set of patches which may eventually get upstream. I spent a while doing that, and then Linus said something that would contravene the code of conduct <laughs> here, where I to repeat it. <laughs> and now Case Cook has taken over trying to get that upstream. But right now it's an external patch set that Debian would probably want to take responsibility for. Are we in any way actually obligated to give in any real statement made by Microsoft to do that? No, but if your kernel can be used to subvert <coughs> the security of other operating systems, then you will probably be blacklisted. There is not actually anything other than a bunch of typing stopping someone from using KX export for Windows. Yeah, I know, I know that. But, but, but I mean, right now, the current state. Uh, do the words say this? No. The words assume that you're not stupid. Right, but what I mean is Ubuntu is currently distributing binaries that would allow that, no? You would have to speak to Ubuntu's lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak on their behalf. I would say this is a really bad idea. Okay. So. The, is there a question about including this patch set in Debian that you want to discuss, or it's just something that needs to be done um, and it's the details of what Well, including the patch set seems relatively uncontroversial. I think the question is, are we going to turn it on by default when booted via secure boot? And well, what would be the point otherwise? I meant as if, it's, if, it's, if it's optional, then, then it has no effect, right? I mean, That's it would obviously not be optional in signed kernels. The question is, what do we do with it in other cases? Uh, I think that's a detail that can be sorted out. Right. This is not really important. Right. It, just, it sounds like this is definitely not, op this is definitely not blocking anything else. Right. We, have, we have one minute left. Uh, the, uh, the blocker for everything is getting a key organized. Uh, is that something that a single person from DSA can do? Does it require getting several people together? Does it well, so uh, the process is basically we generate the key and then submit a certificate request for to Microsoft? Or uh, like no, the process is that we generate a key uh, 
uh, of the appropriate form, which is then embedded in the shim package, which we submit as a which we submit for signing by Microsoft. Okay. They well, not well, so, so uh, we generate a key. key. We, we decide where you store the key. Mm -hmm. We generate the key. You create your own self-signed certificate. And we put that certificate in the shim package. Yes. And then we submit the shim package, package for signing. But but hang on, how do you do, how do, you do the uh, signing request? Uh, is that like a SSL? That sign? requires you to get an EV cert from yes. a CSL. And then you request. upload the binary through a web form that is written in Silver Yes. Using, the, <laughs> using <laughs> that Windows laptop that you have sitting around for that purpose. <laughs> Every other part of this uses these Windows forms, but the Windows where currently does, to upload. Where does it come in? Is it a class? No, it's, it's an EV yeah. code signing, well, it's an EV code signing certificate that's available okay. from two vendors right now. You use that to sign the uploads, you do not use that for anything else. And then they replace that with the, you use that to sign the, which You sign a cabinet, cab which then contains right. your binary, <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> they <laughs> they <laughs> extract it from the cabinets. Silly question, does the existing setup allow for being signed with multiple keys and no, not no. just one Microsoft? No. Uh, so the setup. Does. In theory, it gets the binary back from Microsoft, you add your own keys in addition to the Microsoft key. Right. And then about 10 to 15% of the machines refuse to boot. Right. Because it was not in the yeah, UEFI sure. spec. Uh, it, it was not usefully in the UEFI yes, spec. Fine. It isn't that what SUSE is doing? With, because they have the SUSE key on the HP machines? Yeah, uh, <coughs> yeah that's for HP preloads only, not for any other situation. Yeah, obviously, if you're preloading it on a particular vendor's firmware, then you can make sure that it works there. Yeah. Okay, so DSA needs to purchase an EV cert, uh, generate the key and the self signed pieces that then would be passed on to Steve to jam into the shim package that would then be uh, uploaded via Windows. Wait, at what point is at what point in this, what stage in this does the shim get packed into a signed cabinet? Uh, we upload the shim source to Debian. Yeah. Get that through new. Well, I guess we're not doing source mode though. We well, either we upload up, either we upload the binary. Maybe we want to use that for this package so that the binaries are always built on the build DLC. Okay. But we get the, the we get through binary new and we have. Uh, the shim binary package we extract, well, whoever controls the certificate, whoever controls the key that has the EV cert, <coughs> extracts the executable, puts it in a cab, signs the cab, and all of those steps can be done on Linux. Yeah. Um, then you submit it to Microsoft through the website, which has to be done on Windows. Has anyone tested to see if that site works with uh, the Silverlight compatible thing built Moonlight, on the bottom? Moonlight, I don't think, works with any current sets of libraries and chips. I kind of figured it's thought I'd ask. It yeah. also, in our experience, can't even be run in a virtualized instance of Windows. Oh, you're kidding. Mm. What? So uh, far as we've been able to determine, our IS team has not been able to. That particular Silverlight in application doesn't, because Silverlight in general seems to. I think For the purposes of submission, so it does not to work. Yeah, oh, wow. So, the, so we can't use that. Okay, that, that could be ineptitude with Windows on the part of our IT team. It's not exactly a skill we select for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the DSA obtains an EV cert and generates the key and the self sign cert. Is that uh, clear that DSA is going to do that, or should that be a key manager role? Or is that in dispute? Is that what DSA would really happen over there? DSA would de facto yeah. be in control of the key due to the managing the hardware right. connected to. So, so it makes sense any reason to have a separate role for that. Sure. So then we someone from DSA would also be doing the extraction and signing. <coughs> is there any value to the two level setup that we have in Ubuntu if we are effectively having the key permanently online but in the edge of So we use the, at the moment, we have a two level setup. So that uh, we have something which is FIPS compliant, but not well, approximately FIPS compliant anyway, but not online, uh, and an operational key which we can use to routinely sign grub up those. Right. So uh, I mean, the do we need that? So my understanding of the motivation for that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember it being that we were interested in being able to uh, revoke particular signatures we've done without having to go through Microsoft. Um, the actual implementation of that is somewhat 
questionable due to the fact that we don't have the same process for uh, uh, revocation propagation that Microsoft has. All right. Um, but uh, in theory, at least we should probably do the same thing. Um, I don't know. I, we haven't we haven't used it. It hasn't been useful to date. Um, and part of that is the fact that the fact that we cannot write to DBX means that we cannot. That the way you, you get around this is by simply grabbing an older version of Shim or whatever. So we can certainly provide you with the procedure that we used to generate the uh, old markets. Uh, I don't know of anything at all that's. <coughs> that's it sounds pretty straightforward, but I mean, when you already have it, then it's good to just pop it out. It was sadly not especially straightforward. So, yeah. so um, we'll, we'll get that to talk, talk. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but are you, can you make sure as the DSA person here to do this insert key piece and all the things? Yeah, great. Put your name down so we stuck with it. Yeah. Okay. We're happy with steps beyond that. I think we have an understanding of what's needed and we've got names next to all the tasks. <coughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Are there deadlines for him? Yes. Are we expecting this all to get in for um, It would be nice. It would be well, nice, but of course it's going to depend on when it's starting. It would be sad if we didn't. It would be nice uh, well, yeah. quite. But things need to start moving and we're going to get yes. it done. So, so I'll make sure that if we actually sure. think we're going to get it done for Jesse, so the deadline is Jesse, Jesse, which means that the DSE piece will be done in the month. Yeah. yeah. Are we happy with that? Well, yeah. Not this month. Within a month. Yes. yes. <laughs> but, but the most you're trying to is the most. <laughs> most. Yeah. Okay, so by 28th of September, we will have a. That should be good. And um, if you look at some pieces, can go through new and all that even before then. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah. yeah. It, it may not be useful, but at least that means we, you know, we're not then delayed on anything else. Okay. Gold date, 20th September. Okay. Now then, very shortly after that, we should then be able to get stuff like a uh, working sign work. Um, I will. I will be using a source for the source of the updates for Ralph in this one. Sure. So, uh, and once, so once that filters through, very really shortly after, <coughs> get stuff like signed CD image or signed boot from CD images and that kind of thing. And you know, clearly, I commit to making making sure that works. You've already done this anyway before, so yeah. uh, we, we can work through that. There are tedious. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's just a simple matter of process. Plan on putting the sign plan in the back into the office. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. the way that we do this right now, and that can't be any other way, uh, you need it in a you need it in a dev yes. in order to be able to support upgrades. Yeah. Uh, so this means that uh, that we have to do two stage uploads. Yeah. So we we need to upload we upload web two that's signed by the DAC machinery. Later on, we upload web two signed. Uh, which downloads the signed thing from the archive, verifies it against the keys it expects, and, uh, and it stuffs that into a dev and uploads it. Yes. And the same will happen for Shim. And the Shim works differently because you're waiting for it to come back from Microsoft, oh, yes. and also because we need to verify that Microsoft actually signed the thing against the signed it. Uh, you do that at all. Uh, but yes, functionally. But it's basically, the uh, sound chain will be in the depth in the office. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the DAC pieces that you need to work with when testing the environment should probably happen in parallel while the keys are in the depth. They can. Uh, they can. They can. Unfortunately, the ship, while we use entirely different archive management software and went to the ship of that particular piece of it, it was inspired by DAC and it's quite. Alright. Thanks everybody. Pretty awesome. Jesse. Go, Jesse.